This is Lab Medicine Rounds, a curated podcast for physicians, laboratory professionals, and students. I'm your host, Justin Kreuter, the Bowtie Bandit of Blood, a transfusion medicine pathologist at Mayo Clinic. Today is a very special laboratory medicine rounds. We're, we're, we're rounding with Dr. Charles uh, Sturgis, a professor of, in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology, as well as program director of the Anatomic and Clinical Pathology Residency Program at Mayo Clinic. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Sturgis. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. So this is a really special uh, podcast for us. Uh, we tend to have a, a very diverse audience, uh, ranging from clinicians, pathologists, laboratory professionals, and we have students. But today we're really going to take a, a, a few minutes and really focus on our student listeners, specifically the medical students that are going to be applying for uh, pathology residency programs this year. Uh, so first question I'd like to kind of get started is, you know, this whole why. Why is it important for medical students to prepare for their uh, residency interviews? Um, that's a great question. I think there are a number of reasons why it can be helpful to give some thought to the interview before you actually pop into the window. Um, one is, you know, this year with um, many interviews being done virtually, there's a little bit of a, a distance between people, a physical distance that might not have historically been there. So I think if, you, if the applicant, uh, whether that's for residency or uh, other jobs, takes a, a minute to invest some time and read a little bit about both the institution and the people that he or she might be meeting, then maybe they'll be a little bit more at ease with what can be, especially initially, a, a challenging or stressful environment. So investing, you know, just a little bit of time can give them a sense of calm and maybe also a little a sense of being, uh, of knowing, a sense of being better informed. I know when I go into a new situation, if I don't know anything about the people or the place, I'm a little, you know, not as quite as comfortable as if I have some understanding of what's going on in the surroundings. I imagine that works both ways, right? I mean, as a program director, you want uh, the person you're interviewing to be as relaxed as possible because you're probably going to be the most likely to really kind of see that person at their best uh, and see uh, how they're thinking. And likewise, for the person interviewing uh, to be relaxed, they can have a clear thought process to, to really answer the questions as best as they can. Yes. What, what do you think about, um, you know, when you talk about uh, spending some time uh, preparing and, and, and looking up information about the, uh, the, program they're interviewing, and you mentioned some of the people that they might be interviewing with. What do you recommend that students do to, to prepare for those interviews? Is it looking at uh, websites? Is it going to PubMed? Like, what, what do you recommend students well, I think, think about? I think both of the things that you just mentioned are excellent resources. You know, I'm uh, becoming a senior citizen, and when I was doing interviews for residency, the internet was not a tool that was available. Um, and, it, and it certainly didn't contain all the information that it would now. Uh, so people can you know, check out all the faculty that are in a program. They can identify people with whom they might have specific interests uh, to help tailor their questions. PubMed is another great resource because you can look at what people are publishing and then direct questions to them from a more um, intellectual or academic side. Uh, but I think maybe stepping back just a little bit about preparation for the interview would be simple things like, you know, prior to this interview this morning, I spent at least 30 minutes combing my hair. And doesn't it look beautiful, right? It does. So I think that those simple things, you know, like um, some attention to personal hygiene, especially when people are interviewing remotely, like don't show up to the interview in your pajamas, even though you're doing the interview in your bedroom. And don't have a trace of your kale smoothie on your left front tooth. Like, you know, <laughs> check it out. 
um, so that you're you're really going into it feeling physically empowered and at your best. Um, those things can can be, I think, you know, super super helpful. Another thing is to test out all of your equipment since mm -hmm. we're going to be interviewing virtually or digitally to make sure that your your audio works well because if the person who's remote doesn't hear you well that isn't it's going to potentially be a negative you know in in the interaction and while all these tools are fabulous we don't want those to be the limitation that prevents someone for, for, from performing at their you know their peak or their or their height mm -hmm. Um, so those are, I mean, those sound very simplistic, but I think those are very important things to remember. It's so kind of, maybe if I can ask a little bit about that last point you, you brought up about testing your system out, because I think that really hits on something that's going to be important this year. I imagine, you know, a lot of people are going to be, or a lot of programs are going to be using software that a lot of us are using right now in daily life. But I don't know, maybe there's a program that's using something that an applicant is unfamiliar with. Is that fair game, you think, for an applicant to reach out to that inter program ahead of time to ask them if they can test out their system? Or Yeah, and I think the other thing to do is that maybe at the beginning of the very first interaction they're having, whether that's with a faculty interviewer or perhaps the program administrator, um, you know, to just ask the question, is my, am I coming through well? Are you hearing me well? Are you seeing me well? Um, certainly, uh, contacting the program ahead of time would ex make them realize that your interest is genuine. Um, I think most people are, like you said, most people are increasingly comfortable with these mod modalities. One of the things I think that's challenging in this pandemic time um, and uh, that COVID is complicating, and, and this is, I think, especially relevant in pathology, is that um, in our um, ERAS and NRMP processes for the applic applicants, um, we, I think there are a little bit over a thousand people applying currently this year in the cycle. And you know, here at Mayo, we've received more than 500 applications for our seven positions. So it's a it's a it's a competitive environment, even for a specialty that is not exceptionally competitive. And um, what I'm experiencing as a first-time um, program director, this is a, my kind of maiden voyage through this process, is that. Um, probably 70% of our applicants are um, students who are applying from out of the country. Uh, so these, uh, and, and maybe actually interviewing from out of the country. So these um, tools are allowing us like way greater connectivity than we would have had in the past. Um, but I think um, communication is something that the evaluators are really trying to assess, especially for people who might be coming from countries or cultures where there are different languages. And so for people who are wanting to confirm that they have good English language skills and that they understand you know, the culture, that's gonna be even more challenging over a virtual connection than maybe like when you're sitting across the desk. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage people to think carefully about their speech and to, you know, pronounce things perhaps even slightly more um, definitively or uh, to give their language even more emphasis than they perhaps normally would really focus on enunciating those individual words. Yeah, I, exactly. It's, that's brilliant. I was wondering, kind of relevant to that is sometimes, I know, I know I've done it in, in an interview situation. Sometimes I maybe misspeak at first or so I have kind of that false start or 
you know, times where maybe uh, an interviewer has asked me a challenging question that I'm having a little bit of uh, difficulty conjuring, um, uh, you know, forming an answer to. I was curious, do you have any thoughts or the way students can uh, kind of manage these? I, these are just kind of very, can be very stress inducing. And do you have any thoughts on uh, how students can think about approaching that if that happens to them? Um, well, I think I, I also experience that sometimes, and maybe maybe that's part of why I'm in pathology. <laughs> I mean, just candidly, but so I, I would judge no one uh, on an individual basis about that. I think maybe two things to keep in mind are just honesty, just saying, hey, that's that's a tough question, and I'd like to think about it. You could even say, could you ask me another question and let that one percolate in my mind for a couple of minutes and I'll come back to it. And I, I would, as an interviewer, would have no problem with that. I would actually think that was pretty thoughtful. Um, another thing that I sometimes do when I'm caught between a little bit of a rock and a hard place in my mind and I'm not sure what to say is, I might reply with something that uses humor um, in the sense that I think humor is a is a very adult coping mechanism. It lets the person know that you're thinking um, and you probably want to address what they're saying, but uh, it takes the pressure off of you and off of them, maybe buys you 15, 20 seconds to let your gears spin a little more and then to go to the question. Those might those options might not work for everyone, but those are things I would toss out there as things to consider. I I, I think that's wonderful, and I think how you started it, uh, to respond to I, I just want to point that out and and highlight it, underline it for the listeners uh, who are going to be interviewing the idea that uh, both uh, Dr. Sturgis and I uh, often have these times where we might uh, misspeak or have trouble conjuring an answer. And so uh, it, it's a very normal thing. And so to try to not let that uh, start to you know, take over your mind and, and hijack yourself. And it, it's a very human thing. Um, I, one of the questions, I've been doing a couple of practice interviews for our medical students here at Mayo who are gonna be uh, interviewing at programs. And one of the common questions that, that I've been getting have, have been kind of, you know, what do you, any feedback about my background of where I'm at, right? So, I, you know, a lot of times, a lot of Zoom meetings I'm on now, people are using that sort of uh, digital background uh, of kind of a standardized photo. Um, and then I know that sometimes other people, you see uh, where they are in C2. And, and um, do you have any thoughts? You were talking earlier as we were talking, Dr. Sturgis, about that the professionalism being mindful of your um, your appearance it, and I think that probably does include your background and uh, do you have any thoughts about uh, recommendations which I think are pretty pertinent this year yeah Justin I think that is uh, that's a great question and I'll tell you that um, we had maybe a week or two ago which which you're aware of but we had a we had a meeting to talk about what we were going to do as interviewers uh, here at Mayo for the program. And this came up from the context of, you know, what, what would be the preference here. And there were people who had strong feelings in, in kind of multiple directions. Uh, there were people who thought that using kind of a, a, a prefab Mayo background of some ilk would be preferable. And then there were other people who thought, I think, pretty strongly that um, projecting not only yourself but your environment would would make things more personal and maybe slightly more akin to what we would experience if we were having real, you know, face-to-face -face interactions. And I think I'm I'm a little bit more on the latter half, and maybe that's evidenced by you know what I'm doing here. I'm just sitting in my office. Um, so, you know, if, if, if I were an applicant and I were kind of switching roles, I think it would depend upon, you know, where I were finding myself the day of my interview. 
if I were, you know, traveling and I, you know, maybe were, I were, was in a hotel room or, you know, somewhere out of my own personal space or in a space that wasn't aesthetically pleasing in some way, um, then I would probably choose to use one of those backgrounds. But if I were at home or in a, a space that is kind of me, and I've cleaned it up so it looks, you know, organized and tidy, um, I probably would choose that because I would feel comfortable and it would be an expression of myself. So m I guess my answer is I don't know that there's a right or a wrong, and I would trust people to pick what they think is the best for them. I do think that like, you know, having kale in your teeth and not brushing your hair, your background will be perceived as part of the process. So it is something to give some thought. Um, I, I would hope that no one who's interviewing in the same way that no one who is an interviewee would judge someone, you know, based on whether, you know, their wall is green or blue or says mayo or the background is your kitchen. Um, so, I, I, I would leave that to the individual. Yeah, and I think that's helpful because you've given us, and I agree, there is not really a right or a wrong, but I think you've given us a, a way to approach it, a thought process on on thinking, it, you know, am I in an environment that is reflective of who I am uh, and is going to represent me, and, and I think to your point, represent me professionally. Yes. Uh, and uh, if that answer is no, then I really should probably think about what would be a professional image to, to use one of those kind of background green screens right. with. It's wonderful. One of the, uh, so my last question I wanted to go to, and this also is something I've noticed when I've been doing the practice interviews with our medical students here is, um, you know, sometimes it's hard or difficult for medical students to ask um, relevant questions uh, of the program and the program director. And, uh, and so to highlight for our listeners, uh, you know, the, these interviews are really a two-way street. It's an opportunity for you to, to learn as much about the programs as it is the programs to learn about you. And, and likewise, just like the program is going to be ranking its applicants, uh, you are going to be making your uh, rank list uh, in the year as well. And so uh, it's, it's really important to kind of find out some information. But I think one of the difficult things, and maybe I'm projecting here a little bit, is, is um, you know, if you're a medical student interviewing for a pathology uh, residency program, sometimes um, does it makes sense to say, sometimes it's difficult to know what the relevant questions are. And so I was curious, Dr. Sergers, you know, now knowing what you know now in your position, what are a few questions or areas maybe that pathology residents may want to question that would really be helpful for getting, getting that pulse and that feel for, for the uh, individual program? Well, I think there are, there are a few things that I, just to specifically answer your question, there are a few things that I would think about that maybe I wouldn't have thought about you know, when I was interviewing many, many years ago, um, some of which would be really relevant for an interview setting, some of which might not be. So I'm not going to go to those because I don't want to encourage people, you know, to dig a hole they can't get out of in an interview. Um, I, I think that pathology, like many areas, um, or maybe even all areas in um, professional healthcare delivery is becoming increasingly specialized. So, you know, when someone says, well, like if you meet someone and maybe even if it's at a pathology meeting where everyone is a pathologist, you know, what do you, you, when someone says that you say, well, what do you do? And people want to know, well, you know, are you a, a blood banker or a transfusion medicine doctor like you, or are you a cytopathologist like, like me, or the many, you know, dozens of myriad other little specialty areas. And I think sometimes students are pushing themselves to be 
more differentiated than they need to be at a very early phase. So it's great to have an interest or interests. And those, I think, show that you've really considered options and are thinking about your future. But it's also great, I think, and perhaps even more important to be open-minded. So, you know, you can ask about um, the strengths and weaknesses of programs and see what, and you could ask that same question to a number of people and see if you get reproducible answers or if different people give you very different perspectives. Um, and if you do ask about, you know, kind of focused areas or individual faculty people, I would do that in the context of maintaining a very open mind. Um, I went into pathology thinking I was going to be a pediatric pathologist, and that did not happen. And, you know, the, the outcome that did happen, I think, was better for me. And I, I did that by doing a bunch of things and seeing, you know, what, what worked out the best. I think it's also good to ask some non-pathology, non-professional even questions, not only of the residents and the non-physician people like the program coordinators, but of the faculty. You know, one of the most important parts of my day every day is lunch, which you need only look at me to recognize as truth. Um, and so, you know, you can say, what do you do for lunch? And I think that would actually be very well received. It gives you information about whether you eat on site. It gives you information about whether people eat in groups and engage in social behavior. Um, and that might not be the question for everyone, but questions like that that are open-ended, so not yes and no, that encourage the interviewer to tell you things that you might not even be directly asking that will give you insights into the kind of the way the program exists, you know, globally. Those can, I think, can be very valuable. I think maybe the other important question is to ask about where do the graduates of the program go? You know, what, what do they do? And if, you know, let's say 70% of the graduates of a particular program end up working in academia, running their own labs with NIH funding. And if that's what you want to pursue, then that could be a very good thing. But if that isn't what you wanna pursue, then maybe even though where you're interviewing is a world-class place, maybe that's you know, not the place for you. And if it's a really great place, but 70% of the applicants all go to work in industry or commercial laboratories, which are great jobs and could be wonderful lives, but that's not your you know, goal or life, then maybe that's not the best place for you um, either. So those are things I might encourage people to ask. I, th I think that's brilliant, right? So for our listeners, I mean, I think Dr. Sturgis has really opened up and to think about, there are a couple domains that we might think about posing questions, right? You were talking about, uh, you know, the actual uh, work environment. You're talking about maybe the social environment uh, outside of work or, or like what you're doing during lunch. Um, talking about what, where do the graduates go? And I, I think another component you're telling us or what I'm hearing your answer too is as you're getting these answers there's not necessarily a, a right or a wrong answer like you know to eat lunch or you know what right. the graduates do <laughs> yeah but but how does that jive with your own personal uh, feelings and, and desires uh, at this time that you know and I think also like having the 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 questions be open whatever they are, um, I think that's a struggle for interviewers as well, because when we ask questions that are either one word answer or yes, no answer, that doesn't lead to more conversation. It can give you valuable information. So I think that if the interviewees are aware of that and they ask, 
questions that are more conversational, that will put interviewers who, who aren't honestly professional interviewers, you know, they're, they're, they don't do this every day either, at ease and make the whole thing more uh, like an experience than like an interview, which bodes well for all parties. I wholeheartedly agree. And, and something that I've seen in the past that I think is very effective, because um, again, it demonstrates that uh, somebody has put thought into it. Sometimes I see uh, interviewees that uh, have kind of ri written down and have a list of their questions on a, on a piece of paper or in their folder that they have brought with them to the interview. Um, and and I guess I from hearing your answer, I, I think it's really highlighting for our listeners this is a component of preparation and to think about because uh, maybe it's difficult to ask an open-ended uh, question on the spot and so maybe writing down a couple of thoughts ahead of time and yeah. don't feel uh, afraid to pull that out uh, and just check that when the interviewer asks do you have any questions yeah, and I think um, as the day goes on like I will be interviewing every applicant so they will have been asked a lot of questions and they will have asked many of their questions by two o'clock when I have my like my last of the six or seven people of the day. And it's disheartening as an interviewer if you ask questions and people say, well, all of my questions have been answered. I would encourage the applicants, even if they ask the same questions over and over again, in a way that's like quality control. It's seeing, you know, what are what is everyone saying? And it's far better to ask a question to which you may already know the answer than to say, you know, no, I don't really have any more questions. That leaves the person who's asking um, feeling like maybe you're not entirely interested or enthusiastic about the process. Yeah, yeah, it's so smart. I think to think about uh, you ask a question, you get an answer. I, I think to highlight you know, we've been talking about a lot of different areas and you brought up the point that you're a cytopathologist, I'm a transfusion medicine uh, doc and, and how our lives uh, may be similar and yet very different. And so we might have different answers and that is just hopefully showing the bouquet of what a program is. I like is. that, yeah. Fantastic. So today we, we've been rounding with uh, Dr. Charles Sturgis, uh, a professor uh, of uh, laboratory medicine and pathology at Mayo Clinic and program director of the anatomic uh, and clinical pathology residence program. Thank you so much, Dr. Sturgis, for taking time to discuss interviewing with us today. It was my pleasure. Um, thank you for the opportunity and everybody out there, uh, be well, uh, stay safe, keep healthy. Take care of yourselves. If you've enjoyed Lab Medicine Rounds podcast, please subscribe. We invite you to share your thoughts and suggestions via email. Please direct any suggestions to mcleducation at mayo.edu and reference this podcast. Until our next rounds together, we encourage you to continue to connect lab medicine and the clinical practice through insightful conversations.